Harrington Aidney Campbell, and this is the History of Musical Theatre Podcast. Although Balanchine never married Alexandra Nelliver, they lived together and they called each other their husband or wife, and the company around them, after a little bit of scandal, treated them as such. And thus began 1928 for the newly minted Balanchines-ish. Tamara Jeeva, not seen as particularly valuable to Diaghilev or to Balanchine, and already in the United States, stayed in the world of musical reviews. She spent the year choreographing and performing in Whoopi. I'm going to make an educated guess and say that you haven't seen their show. I have two reasons for this. Firstly, it's a 1920s musical comedy, and most people haven't seen a whole lot of these. Maybe one or two. Anything Goes is a one a lot of people are familiar with. Secondly, there are some elements of this show that have not aged well. The book Broadway Musical Show by Show is a fantastic resource for summaries on shows that may have limited information otherwise available about them. Let me share a little of the summary from this book. <clears throat> After comic adventures that involve hiding out on an Indian reservation and Henry in blackface posing as a singing waiter, the girl is reunited with her true love, an Indian half-breed who turns out to be white. I'm going to go out on a limb and say it would take a lot of adaptation to make this show performable again. People have enough issues with Annie Get Your Gun. The show was produced by Florence Ziegfeld. It starred Eddie Cantor, a comedian who'd been part of the Ziegfeld Follies for the five previous years. By all accounts, it was a successful show, and it would later be adapted to a movie. Tamara Jeeva would find herself settling into the world of Broadway. Also this year, the future Balanchine ballerina, Patricia Wilde, then Patricia White, was born. Lincoln Kirstein co-founded the Harvard Society for Contemporary Art. Muriel Stewart dances with and choreographs for the Chicago Civic Opera Ballet. Before we go back to the ballet ruse, I think it's important to talk a little about why Balanchine married the women he married. They were all dancers. Particularly dancers he wanted to create work on. Had Tamara Tormanova been a little older, it's possible she too would have been a Mrs. Balanchine. So what kind of dancer was Danilova? Her description in George Balanchine the Ballet Maker was as follows. Danilova was an extremely talented dancer, with wit, with elegance, and very beautiful legs. They would become as famous in the world of ballet as Dietrich's were in the world of film. Unlike Jeeva, she had come through the Imperial Ballet School system. She had been the year above Balanchine, and they'd shared the stage and even partnered each other as children in Petipa ballets. The relationship was always a little contentious, with Balanchine often falling short of Danilova's expectations for what a partner, someone who proclaimed himself her husband, should do. At one performance, she was the only soloist not to receive flowers. After complaining to Diaghilev, who passed it on to Balanchine, at the next performance, she had so many flowers she couldn't carry them all home. He bought her a green car, which she'd used as style inspiration, choosing and buying a few outfits to match it. And then there were some issues with the import taxes, so he just gave the car to a random on the dock. It wasn't all George's fault, though. On another occasion, he brought home lapis lazuli earrings from a trip. Danilva was deeply offended by the fact that they weren't diamonds. She threw them back in his face, which she also did when he dared to buy her cheap perfume. Diaghilev played as both a mediator and an antagonist in their relationship. Danilova was valuable to him in a way Jiva hadn't been. We'll see a little bit more of that in a minute. Much of Balanchine's work, after he'd proved himself in his early opera ballets, had roles created specifically for her. The Triumph of Neptune was her first real success. Still, she was never the favourite of Diaghilev, or more importantly, of Lord Rothermore. This was expressed in the creation of Apollo. Balanchine created one of his most famous works in 1928. Apollo, or Apollo Musette, is the earliest Balanchine ballet still in the repertoire that hasn't been lost to the expanse of time. Earlier works like Cotillion and La Concurrence are just gone. We don't know what they looked like. Apollo was a great neoclassical work, 
taking a stripped-back Stravinsky score and a handful of dancers to tell the story of Apollo being born and meeting the muses. He meets three muses, Polyhymnia, Calliope, and Tepsichore. Respectively, they are the muses of mime, poetry, and dance. The role of Tepsichore is the largest, perhaps not surprising for, you know, a ballet. Balanchine himself credited much of the success of the work to him daring not to use all his ideas. The work is beautiful in its simplicity. But don't let the simplicity of the ballet trick you. For the dancers, the choreography was immensely challenging to learn. There is now a whole system designed to prepare dancers for the peculiarities of the Balanchine repertoire. At the time, the dancers were trained for Petipa. The role of Apollo was created on Serge Lelfa, on the direction of the other Serge. Balanchine gave the primary role, Tepsichore, to his muse, Alexandra Danilova. But Balanchine didn't have the total creative control over his work that would enable him in later years. A significant backer, the aforementioned Lord Rothamore, wanted the role to go to Alice Nikitina. Diaghilev was bound by his backers. After seeing the ballet with Nikitina as Tepsichore, Serge concluded that the solo given to her was boring and should be taken out of the work. Balanchine suggested that, hey, maybe you just picked a boring dancer. Just saying. They tried removing it and then opted for the much better solution of putting Danilova back in the role. The two dancers alternated performances, and after Alice performed the Paris premiere, Alexandra took to the stage for the London opening. Over Balanchine's life, the ballet was endlessly reworked, which I'll talk more about in later episodes. One immediate change was the ditching of the Diaghilev-style sets and costumes for much simpler ones designed by Chanel. This would also become iconic Balanchine. Later in the year, he also created The Gods Go Begging, another lost ballet which was not hugely significant. 1929. Lydia Lopakova, who we met a few weeks ago, was only dancing occasionally. She performed a few times with the Ballet Russe, including one role that no one had ever really liked her in, Firebird. Living in London, she was approached to create some dances for a new film, Dark Red Roses. It was going to be the first talking picture made in London, two years after The Jazz Singer in Hollywood. She was asked to create some dances with an oriental tone on the theme of lust. It honestly didn't have that much to do with the film itself. Lydia brought George Balanchine and Anton Dolan, another dancer you'll hear more about as we go, on to work with her. Lopakova was initially going to choreograph the short ballet herself, but ended up giving the job to Balanchine. If in doubt, have Balanchine choreograph it. Not a bad general plan. Lincoln Kirstein had three important events this year. The Harvard Society of Contemporary Art, which he had founded the year before, leads to the founding of the Museum of Modern Art. On a holiday in Venice, Kirstein incidentally comes across a funeral procession. It is the final goodbye for Sir Diaghilev. Diaghilev had died while Balanchine, Dolin, and Lopakova were working in London on the film. There is some irony to the fact that Serg didn't believe in ballet on film. He loved film, but he thought dancing belonged on the stage. At the time of his death, talents he fostered were working on a film. Of the death, Balanchine said, It is because of Diaghilev that I am whatever I am today. This would be a major creative setback for Balanchine, if not for Lincoln's third event, a little earlier in the year. He saw his first Balanchine ballet, The Prodigal Son. Whereas Apollo would be best described as neoclassical, Prodigal Son drops the classical. It is not a classical ballet. It contains acrobatic elements, for example. The principal role, the siren, is on point, but mostly for the sake of the height it gave her. There are bourrées, a series of tiny, tiny steps so, so close to each other, seen in ballets like Swan Lake, that's really, really common in point work. It's one of the first things you learn. But in Prodigal Son, these are performed in parallel instead of turned out. Balanchine's earliest work was famous for its inventive duets, and Prodigal was no exception. For Diaghilev, the appeal of the story may have had less to do with its biblical origins than to its warning to wayward ballet masters. 
Nijinsky and Massine were both former lovers of Diaghilev, who worked as choreographers and then married women. The idea of them returning apologetic may have held a draw. It was also notable that many of the most impactful moments of the ballet aren't danced, but story elements. The sun returning home. That's not to say that the dancing isn't impressive, but whereas in Apollo what you would remember were specific steps, in Prodigal what you would remember were specific events. It still contained a number of elements of a Diaghilev ballet, like a heavy emphasis on props that would be absent from Balanchine's later work. It was this ballet that introduced Lincoln Kirstein to George Balanchine. Balanchine's creative situation became haphazard at best. Ballet is expensive to create, and because of that, it requires a degree of stability. This stability can be the Tsar of Russia or a well-connected, stubborn-as-hell impresario. But Diaghilev was dead. Balanchine's next offer came from the King of France. Sort of. That's where the money came from, anyway. He was asked to create Le Creature de Promethe to Beethoven music at the Paris Opera Ballet. They were also looking for a ballet master, and the ballet would be the perfect job interview. What happened next was bad in the short term, but probably good in the long term. Balanchine came down with pneumonia, which then turned to pleurisy, which was, you know, what killed Anna Pavlova. George made it a step further, though, with his pleurisy then developing into tuberculosis. Serge Lilfa, the prodigal son himself, was recommended by Balanchine to take over the work. As Creatures de Promethe premiered with Serge Lilfa credited as the sole choreographer, Balanchine was moved from one hospital to another, where they suggested removing one of his lungs. In terms of organs you'd want to hold on to, I'd say that lungs are like reasonably high up on the list. I recently performed a show just recovered from the viral infection that will not be named, and the toll that it takes on you to have suboptimal lungs is huge. To do it with one lung would just be impossible. He refused the surgery, though, still sensitive from the botched surgery on his knee. It took a long time, but he finally recovered. He then went with Alexandra to a performance of the new work which had been quite successful, but when they went to the stage door to go and congratulate the choreographer, they were denied. Serge Lilfer does not want to see George Balanchine. Then the reason came out. In the coming days, it was announced that Lilfer would be continuing on at the Paris Opera Ballet, now in the role of ballet master. With historical hindsight, it's probably good for George that he didn't end up at the Paris Opera. It was famous for its backstage politics, <laughs> and George Balanchine, the ballet master, described it as Byzantine. Next up was London. Balanchine was offered a job to choreograph the Cochrane Review. He may have actually gotten the job at the suggestion of Alex Nicotina, of being a boring Tepsichore fame. The Cochrane Review ran in a small theatre and was much more chic than the Follies, its large American counterpart. After his work in the West End, he went back to another big European company the Dutch National Ballet. Particularly judicious listeners might remember its old ballet master and choreographer, August Bournonville. His particular style, small, understated movements, was deeply embedded into the company. Balanchine was employed for a time as a guest ballet master. The Danes wanted something new and different, and by that I mean Diaghilev's Fokin and Massine works of decades past. Only two of Balanchine's own ballets were ever performed by the Dutch National Ballet, Apollo and Barabo. At least the former was liked. Overall, it was not a success. Balanchine's scathing review of the Danes included the condemnation that their brains were empty unless they saw something resembling a sandwich. Now, that's on the weirder side of insults I've personally heard. I might try it, though. I'll let you know how it goes. It was returning home from Copenhagen that the earring incident occurred. It was the beginning of the end for George Balanchine and Alexandra Danilova. For the majority of their relationship, they were colleagues and friends rather than being in a passionate love affair. Quoting from the Balanchine bio again, they were not exactly monogamous. A pretty significant part of their relationship had been that of an artist and his muse. 
He'd created a number of roles on her, but outside of the confines of a ballet company, there was no outlet for this work. Danilova went to London to perform in a musical comedy. After a while, she wrote him a letter suggesting that it would be better for them to separate. Balanchine, eventually, replied, saying that if that was how she felt, I guess they're separated then. He handled it all in a really, really mature way. Like, for example, when shortly after Balanchine was offered a four-month contract to be the ballet master at the Monte Carlo Ballet, the earliest of the Ballet Russe revival companies, he didn't ask Danilova to come with him. When she queried him about this, he responded that it was going to be a young company. Apparently the cutoff was somewhere between Balanchine at 27 years old and Danilova at 28. Is it 27 and a half? <laughs> For Tamara Jeeva, she spent the year in another musical review. Reviews, due to their extremely varied nature, would prove an important springboard for many a dancer, especially in the early years onto the Broadway stage and into the world of musical theatre and even sometimes straight plays. Clifton Webb, Fred Allen and Libby Holman had been the stars of The Little Show the year before. The Little Show was what the name suggests, a smaller, lower-budget version of reviews like The Ziegfeld Follies, The George White Scandals, or The Passing Show. In 1930, they prepared again to bring The Little Show to the stage. The second Little Show, as it was called, didn't feature Tamara Jeeva. It also didn't feature Clifton Webb, Fred Allen, and Libby Holman. After it was clear the producers weren't going to bring them back, Max Gordon put a show together around them, This new show, Three's a Crowd, had the same musical team as the original Little Show and featured Mrs. Balanchine, even if she was only that in name alone. On Broadway, I'm going to talk really quickly about a show our characters aren't in. I promise there's a reason. The Bandwagon was produced by Max Gordon and had music by Arthur Schwartz and lyrics by Howard Dietz, the same production team as Three's a Crowd and the Little Show before it. The major cast included Fred and Adele Astaire, the brother and sister dance team, of which one would go on to be one of the most famous tap dancers of all time. There's actually a Fred Astaire biopic in the works that I'm really excited about. I want to bring tap dancing back into movies. It's just like a Marvel movie and someone starts tap dancing. It could work. We can make it happen. The Bandwagon was a musical review, but compared to contemporaneous reviews, it had a much more homogenous style and consistency throughout. In the 50s, after Fred Astaire's transition to film, it got a screen adaptation. It kept five songs and its leading man, and it swapped out his sister for Sid Charisse, also seen in Singing in the Rain. And it added a plotline. 1931. Little Joan Bailey's father sees an ad in the paper saying Muriel Stewart is looking for six prodigies. Stewart was a former Anna Pavlova company member, so it was a pretty significant opportunity. Joan is accepted. She's the only one in the company not yet on point. 1932. Tamara Jeeva appeared once again in a musical review, with Arthur Schwartz, Howard Dietz, Max Gordon, Alberta Rutsch, and a couple of cast members from Three's a Crowd and The Bandwagon. The show did well, factoring in that the Great Depression had pretty much decimated ticket prices. South of the border in Cuba, a 12-year-old Alicia Alonso makes her performance debut in The Sleeping Beauty. 1933. For Tamara Jeeva, she took her next step in her Broadway transformation, performing in a straight play, like not a musical. The show was called The Divine Drudge. Balanchine left the Ballet Russe after his short contract and went about founding his own company. He didn't have any money, but he did have Tamara Tormanova leave the Ballet Russe with him. He set about finding a backer, which took the form of Edward James. James was married to actress and dancer Tilly Loesch, and so he decided that he would buy her a ballet company. I wish I'd thought of asking for that. My birthday's just passed. I'm getting my first pair of point shoes, though, which is almost as good. This new company, Le Ballet, such a creative name. Balanchine created six new works, three for Tilly Loesch and three for Tamara Tormanova. 
Laurent, Le Valse de Beethoven, and The Seven Deadly Sins for the former, and Fast, Le Song, and Mozartiana for the latter. I'm going to tell you a bit more about two of them, The Seven Deadly Sins and Mozartiana. The Seven Deadly Sins, also known by its French name, Le Sept Peche Capito, had music by Kurt Weil and lyrics by Bertolt Brecht. Yes, lyrics. It was a sung piece with Tilly Loesch and Lottie Lenya playing the dancing and singing roles, respectively. If you're a theatre history person, you may be familiar with Brecht as a German playwright whose works are never performed the way he intended because audiences like to be invested in the stories they watch, actually. His notable works up to this point included the Thrupney Opera and the Rise and Fall of the City of Mahogany. In his later career, he would go on to write Life of Galileo, Mother Courage and Her Children, and The Resistible Rise of Arto Ui. This was his last collaboration with Kurt Weill, the composer he'd worked with on both Thrupney Opera and Mahogany. Kurt Weill would later write the show Street Scene, along with a wide range of more orchestral music. Lottie Lanyard was to Kurt Weill what Gwen Verdon was to Bob Fosse, or Danilova, Zarina, Tall Chief and the Clerk were to Balanchine. Less so Jeeva. Oh yeah, spoiler alert, I guess. He was both her first and second husband, with them divorcing in 1933, remarrying in 1937, and remaining together until his death in 1950. For both of them, their most remembered works are their collaborations with each other. Mozartiana was created for Tamara Tormanova. It is set to music by Tchaikovsky. If your guess was Mozart, you're actually not too far off. This particular piece was Tchaikovsky's homage to Mozart. Mozartiana will take many forms over the course of Balanchine's life, with edits and adjustments made over time. It would be his now ex-de facto wife, Alexandra Danilova, who would help restage it at the New York City Ballet. I'm just going to town on the spoilers here. The ballets weren't well received in Paris, and even less so in London where they had to contend with the Colonel de Basil's Ballet Russe. Agnes de Mille, who'd later be described by Joan Bailey as not yet that Agnes de Mille, saw the works and had mixed, although largely negative, reviews. For every point of praise, it came with an equal serving of criticism. Balanchine's work in Le Rente was genius insofar as it covered up Tilly Losh's technical shortcomings. Tamara Tormanova was moving in Mozartiana in spite of the work itself being thin. The company only lasted one season. Things for Tilly Losh and Edward James didn't turn out great either. They had a very public and very scandalous divorce before long. I guess it is better for me to stick to my point shoes. In the intervening time, Lincoln Kersin had graduated Harvard, worked with Romola Nijinsky on a biography of her husband Vaslav, and been taking annual trips to Europe to see ballet. Le Ballet was a flop as a company, but it was after one of their performances that Balanchine and Kersin met. And the former heard the latter's idea for a ballet company in America. Why Balanchine, though? He'd just come off a disaster of a season. He'd never really been anywhere very long. Why not a more established choreographer like Massine or Lilfer? Well, I mean, those two already had jobs. And pretty stable ones. Massine was the ballet master and chief choreographer for the Ballet Russe, and Lilfer did the equivalent job at the Paris Opera Ballet. Balanchine was a free agent. After a week of discussions, Balanchine agreed, saying America had always been his dream, but they couldn't start a company right away. First, they needed a school. The original plan was one in Hartford, Connecticut. By plan, I mean they had people they were going to work with, they had a proposed site, it was a very set plan. But then Balanchine changed his mind and decided it had to be New York. He'd also thought Tamara Tormanova would be joining him, but she had signed back with the Ballet Russe, and so was unavailable for the time. In the words of George Balanchine the Ballet Maker, at the age of 29, nine years after arriving in the West, Balanchine was on his way to a new world and a new life. His only connection, the 26-year-old Lincoln Kirstein, whom he barely knew, and an ex-wife he hadn't seen in a dozen years. 1934 began with the founding of the School of American Ballet. 
As Balanchine put it, he was brought out to teach and create American ballet. When I say began, I mean that on the second day of January, the first classes were held. People would have barely caught up on their New Year's sleep deprivation, and they were held in a space that had once belonged to Isadora Duncan. The initial faculty was small, Balanchine himself, alongside former Marinsky principal and Anna Pavlova partner Pierre Vladimirov, and American Dorothy Littlefield. Many of the earliest students also came from some degree of Russian ballet tradition. As the Pavlova and Diaghilev troops had toured around the country, dancers had left to start their own studios. Mikhail Fokin, the choreographer who had shaped much of the dance landscape Balanchine grew up in, also had an established New York school. This didn't endear them to George, though, who worked tirelessly to create the type of dancer he wanted. He wanted to create a new American style of ballet. Kirstein would say of American young women that they were basketball champions and queens of the tennis court whose proper domain was athletics. They were long-legged, long-necked, slim-hipped, and capable of endless acrobatic virtuosity. It was this virtuosity that would be refined. The first ballet to come out of this new school, this new company, was Serenade. Balanchine was used to working with trained dancers in normal numbers, in a typical petit pie in hierarchy. This is not what he had for Serenade. He had 17 women, maybe three guys. They weren't raised in the imperial ballet system. What was created was Serenade, subtitled A Dance in the Moonlight. If you've seen clips from this work, you'll absolutely understand this subtitle. The soft blue of the tutus and the lights. Ugh, it's so pretty. It's so pretty. (laughs) It used a lot of odd numbers in lines. Not odd as in the opposite of even, one, three, five, seven, etc. Although they did often have that, but odd in the sense of unusual. If you think of Dance of the Hours from Coppelia, 24 dancers in four straight lines, each dancer standing directly behind the dancer in front of her. This was not what they had in Serenade. The fact that the dancers were less trained meant that the soloist parts were split more completely between the dancers, rather than being given to fewer specific soloists based on rank. Under-trained dancers may be able to execute some more complicated steps, but to expect that one would be able to execute all of the complicated steps in the ballet was a bit beyond the company at the time. Over the years, the ballet has been reworked to better fit the traditional ballet company structure, which the New York City Ballet has. There are three principal roles in the final version of this ballet. For her SAB workshop or graduating showcase, friend of the podcast and Broadway ballerina, Lyrica Woodruff danced the part of the Russian girl. Balanchine took the music and swapped the third and fourth movements, the legato and allegro or Russian movements respectively, so that the ballet ends on a sad note, whereas the music in its original form ends on a more uplifting note. The choreography itself took from the quotidian things that happened in rehearsals. Side note, I love the word quotidian. Three notable examples of this are the opening, where the dancers hold their hands up, mimicking a day in the studio when they were shielding their eyes from the sun. One dancer arrived late, and her onstage counterpart does the same. At one point, a dancer in rehearsal slipped. It was placed in the choreography. Looking at contemporary productions of the ballet, it's easy to see elements of the post petipa pre balanchine choreographers. Fokine, Massine, and the like. It is somewhat reminiscent of the Willies in Giselle or Le Sylphides, but the original production had a sharpness to it which allays these claims and fits it a little bit more in Balanchine and Kirstein's understanding of what they wanted to create. The ballet didn't have a plot. It's famously plotless. Over time, people have invented countless versions of the story which fit some but never all of the choreography. Balanchine did once tell Danilova that the man and woman together on stage were a husband and wife going through life together. The girl alone had had affairs and was left alone. That was Danilova's part. The absolute gall of George Balanchine to criticise Alexandra Danilova for being unfaithful is kind of absurd. Serenade received one performance outside of New York that year, on a private estate, as a 26th birthday present, Eddie Warburg 
asked for the ballet, alongside two others, to be performed. Apparently their lawn never recovered. I'm starting to think that the subtitle for this episode should be stupidly extravagant gift ideas. Tamara Jeeva did another play this year, The Red Cat, named after the cabaret theatre where the action takes place. Joan Bailey also did a play, On the Other Side of the Country. She was one of six Muriel Stewart students performing in A Midsummer Night's Dream at the Hollywood Bowl. The production involved a number of celebrities, including a 13-year-old Mickey Rooney as Puck. This year, Jack D'Ambrose is born in Massachusetts. He originally had a less cool, more American-sounding name, but his mother decided to change the family name to sound more French for social climby reasons. 1935 was the year Joan Bailey and Muriel Stewart parted ways. They parted on good terms to work with separate groups. Joan Bailey began studying and performing with renowned flamenco dancer Carmelita Maracci. Joan became the only member of the group to perform solo other than its founder. Carmelita is far less known than many of her contemporary contemporary dance counterparts, like Isadora Duncan and Martha Graham. She had an unwillingness to perform unless under perfect conditions and a distaste for commercialization. She also didn't really like teaching. Muriel Stewart left her own dance company in Los Angeles to teach at the newly founded School of American Ballet, a school that was now associated with a company, the American Ballet. It's going to get really confusing because in previous seasons I've talked about ballet theatre, which becomes the American Ballet Theatre. The American Ballet becomes the New York City Ballet. I didn't make the rules, that's just what it is. This company had a repertoire which included the previous year's serenade, Le Ballet's Le Songs et Laurent, now Dreams and Errant, respectively, as well as three new works, Alma Mater, Reminiscence, and Transcendence. Alma Mater was a football ballet by a man who had never seen American football. He figured he'd seen soccer and it was close enough. Estranged ex-wife Tamara Jeeva now became significantly less estranged as she took on roles within the company notably taking over roles that had belonged to Tilly Loesch. Eugene Loring was also part of the company. We'll meet him again next episode. They had performances in Hartford, Connecticut and in New York, and then a 14-week tour. Well, two of the three happened. The tour fell apart a few stops in when the manager ran off with the money. They went home to regroup. Regrouping involved a contract with the Met Opera. Kirstein was excited. Balanchine was less so. The ballet he wanted to put on stage, even in an opera, was eye-catching. Another word for distracting to the management at the Met. Quoting from the biography again, They criticised Balanchine for showing no respect for tradition, to which Balanchine rejoined, Of course not. The tradition of ballet at the Met is bad ballet. He had become significantly jaded since his years with the Monte Carlo Opera Ballet. Balanchine's most notable work in 1936 with the Met Opera was the highly controversial Orpheo and Eurydice. You know, Orpheus and Eurydice. What was controversial about it? It was a dance drama where he put the dancers on stage and the singers in the pit. That did not make him friends with the opera. Interestingly, a lot of his adaptations that he made to the text are quite similar to what we see in the contemporary Hades Town. Someone with more musical skill than me should do an analysis of those two works. Or I could do a season on Greek mythology and theatre. That could be cool. Maybe one day. He continued to create ballets for operas and occasionally had the good fortune to have a ballet performed before a shorter opera. Can you hear the sarcasm? Outside of the Met, though, there were still some creative opportunities. This year, Balanchine choreographed for two Broadway productions. The first was Ziegfeld Follies of, you know, 1936. This year's production had an all-star cast, even by Follies standards. There was Fanny Bryce, who would have the musical Funny Girl written about her. The Nicholas Brothers. I'm going to link to the Stormy Weather chair dance in the description and in the show notes because, oh my goodness, that is amazing tap dancing. And Josephine Baker, who was one of the most famous cabaret performers of all time. The latter two, three, the Nicholas Brothers and Josephine Baker, are all African American, which will be important when we get to Balanchine's Four Temperaments. The production's other choreographer was Robert Alton. 
Balanchine did the ballet, Alton the jazz. He would later be known as the person who discovered Gene Kelly. Alton had previously trained under Mikhail Morkin, who was a previous Anna Pavlova dance partner. The show ran for a bit and then closed and reopened later in the year. In this second version, it would feature Gypsy Rose Lee of the musical Gypsy. With everything I described, you'd think it would be a resounding success, but it really wasn't. It was the next show that really made waves. The second musical was Richard Rogers and Lorenz Hart's On Your Toes. They collaborated on the book with George Abbott. I've spoken a little bit before about this show in the development of the musical because it was the first musical comedy where the dancing actively progressed the story. It included in it the jazz ballet Slaughter on 10th Avenue. The principal role was danced by Tamara Jeeva. One review of her performance said she can burlesque it with the authority of an artist on holiday. Her work in the jazz ballet crossover space had prepared her well for this role. The first act also included a send-up of Shahrazad, one of the very famous, very orientalist ballets. Beautiful self-promotion segue, last week's interview with Phil Chan talks about the history of Orientalism in ballet. I thought it was a really interesting conversation. You should be able to find it wherever you're listening to this episode. Back to the story. It was at the opening night party that George Balanchine would meet Brigitte Hartwig, who went by the stage name Vera Zarina. The show was actually initially written as a film for Fred Astaire, but he thought the gangster role would be too different from his regular top hat and tails for his audience to accept. A project that did actually happen in Hollywood this year was a film adaptation of Romeo and Juliet, with dances by Agnes DeMille and featuring a number of the Marachi girls, including Joan Bailey. This connection came through classes Agnes had taken with Carmelita and Co. She was still not yet that Agnes DeMille. The professionalism and technique of the Marachi girls made DeMille invite them to audition for her. The whole group was cast. Lincoln Kirstein produced some ballet this year, away from Balanchine, with a short-lived company he called The Ballet Caravan. The works here were pretty explicitly American, with strong Americana themes. This included Billy the Kid and Pocahontas. 1937. Away in Cuba, Alyssa Alonso marries dancer... Ferdinand Alonso, whose name she takes. This halts her training a little. George Balanchine choreographed the newest Rogers and Hart musical. The cast included the Nicholas Brothers again. This musical was notable for three reasons. One, it was the first Rogers and Hart show to run for more than a year. Two, its film adaptation was the start to the putting on a musical to save the town trope. And three, It was the place where Balanchine invented the dream ballet. This is an innovation that is often attributed to Agnes DeMille, and I may have done that two seasons ago. I'm sorry. (laughs) His work on Broadway was less notable, though, than his work at the Met. Over the time the American Ballet was joined with the Met Opera, there were only two full dance programs, one of which was a Stravinsky evening. There will be many more Stravinsky evenings. In fact, I just checked the New York City Ballet website and they have a Stravinsky festival happening in May. If you go, make sure to say hi to Lauren Johnson for me. Again, listen to the interview if you want to know who she is. This first program, I think I can comfortably say, was pretty significant. The evening featured a revival of Apollo, Jeu de Cartes, or Card Game, which had a commission score, and Le Baiser de la Fée, or The Fairy's Kiss, which was Stravinsky's homage to Tchaikovsky. I hope he wasn't homaging Mozartiana, because then it would be Stravinsky's homage to Tchaikovsky's homage to Mozart. I wonder how many layers I can do of that. I think that would be really cool. The program was a huge success, both critically and commercially, but it also marked the final year of collaboration between the American Ballet and the Met Opera and the final year we're covering in this episode. Next week will be an interview with someone. I'm still organizing it. And the week after, we will see more of Vera Zarina. We'll also meet Jerome Robbins, Jose Limon, and at least one more future Mrs. Balanchine. I hope you enjoyed. Until next week, keep dancing.
Thank you.